Chapter One of the Captain's Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Captain's Story by William S. Martin. Chapter One. I travelled among unknown men in lands beyond the sea, nor did I know, sweet home, till then, what love I bore to thee. Tis past that melancholy dream, nor will I quit thy shore a second time, for still I seem to love thee more and more. Wordsworth towards the close of a beautiful day in autumn the last rays of the setting sun were gliding the tops of the mountains which overhang the picturesque valley of bergestras along which winds the road from heidelberg to frankfurt the heavy laden country carts and wagons were toiling slowly along the dusty highway both horses and drivers looking hot and tired, and both, no doubt, very glad that they had nearly reached the end of their day's journey, while every now and then a horseman or a carriage with ladies and gentlemen inside dashed rapidly along, and soon left the more heavily loaded vehicles far behind. What a striking picture of human life! and the great journey we are all taking some of us struggling wearily and oftentimes painfully but always let us trust hopefully under a heavy load and others trotting merrily along their course happy and apparently at least free from care who shall say which of the two shall reach the end most safely while the broad high road presented this animated scene the steep rocky footpath cut in the side of the mountain and leading up to the old ruined castle of arburg on its summit was almost deserted not quite deserted though for toiling up the steep ascent was an old man who in spite of the help afforded him by his stout bamboo cane looked very tired as he went slowly along he was rather a strange-looking old man respectably dressed and with a pleasant-looking face but his clothes and general appearance were different from those of the people commonly seen about there and his bronzed weather-beaten features showed him to be if not a foreigner one who had evidently been for some time in a foreign country indeed the little boy who passed him on his way down to the valley with his goats and the little girl going home with her bundle of sticks for the fire seemed half afraid of him as they bade him good night and even when he had gone by they turned round to look at him as he went on up the mountain side in spite of his evident weariness the stranger kept bravely on and just as the sun was disappearing behind a long range of mountains in the west he reached the ruins of the old castle of which only one tower and a few walls were then standing here he sat down to rest himself on a large heap of stones which had long since fallen from the walls of the castle and were now all overgrown with lichens and ferns and seemed for some moments lost in thought his eyes wandered over the rich landscape which lay spread out beneath his feet then giving vent to the emotions which filled his heart he exclaimed yes this is the old place again and after forty years absence i have at last returned to take one more look at these mountains and forests which i remember so well there too far away down the valley glides the beautiful river along whose banks 
I so often wandered when I was a boy. Ah, it is a true saying, there is no place like home. And yet, after all, our real home is not in this world, but in heaven. There are all who were dear to me, and there I trust soon to meet them again. But now I am left alone, alone in the world. What a change a few short years have made. The old man sat silent for a few minutes, and then in a voice full of emotion began singing part of a beautiful English hymn, which touchingly expresses the instability of all human affairs. Change and decay on all around I see. O thou that changest not, abide with me while he was singing two children hearing him came close up behind him and when he had finished began to cough in order to attract his attention for some time he took no notice but at last he turned and saw two nicely dressed children a little boy and girl who wished him good evening and made a bow he was about to speak to them when their father who had also heard him sing came up and supposing him to be an englishman said to him in english although sir we are strangers it is true those beautiful words you were singing which i am sure come from your heart prove to me that we both look up to one common father in heaven i am the pastor of the little village you can see down there at the foot of the mountain but it is growing dark and if as i presume you are a stranger in these parts i can gladly offer you the simple accommodation of my cottage for the night the stranger answered in german your kind invitation is very welcome sir an old sea captain like me is not much in the habit of paying compliments i can only say i gladly accept your hospitality guided by the last glimmer of twilight they took their way at once towards the peaceful village the steeple of which was just peeping up above the trees on their way the captain told the pastor that he had only arrived at the neighboring village of arbach that afternoon but said he i could not rest tired as i was with my day's travelling until i had been up here to look at the old castle which i have not seen for forty years End of chapter 1 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 2 of Captain's Story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Captain's Story by William S. Martin Chapter 2 I knew by the smoke that so gracefully curled above the green elms that a cottage was near, and I said, if there's peace to be found in the world, a heart that was humble might hope for it here it was noon and on flowers that languished around in silence reposed the voluptuous bee every leaf was at rest and i heard not a sound but the woodpecker tapping the hollow beech tree moor night had already closed in when they reached the village and the moon was just appearing over the tops of the mountains here they were met by the pastor's wife she had already heard of the stranger's arrival from the two children who had run home before pray do not be alarmed at the sight of a strange and unexpected guest said the old man to her 
I hope my arrival will not inconvenience you at all. Not in the least, sir, replied she. You are very welcome to such accommodation as we can offer. Upon this they entered the house, and were soon comfortably seated in the parlor, while the children, who had heard that the stranger was a great traveler, listened very attentively, hoping that he would begin talking of his long voyages and perhaps tell them some interesting stories of his adventures this evening however they were doomed to be disappointed for though the captain could have easily satisfied their curiosity and amused them for a long time with an account of some of the dangers he had passed through and the many foreign countries he had visited he seemed just then to be more inclined to seek information on different points than to talk about himself and his own doings he began by asking the pastor a great many questions about different places in the neighborhood and the people several of whose names he knew who used to live there and seemed very much interested in all he heard he then inquired whether there were still living any descendants of the former pastor a mr buchanan so far as i know there are none replied the pastor indeed i understand he had only one son a regular scapegrace who left home a long time ago and has never been heard of since it must be nearly forty years since pastor buchanan lived here he added perhaps you remember him indeed i do said the captain i remember him well for he was my father and i am no other than the only son you spoke of is it possible cried the worthy man a little disconcerted are you indeed that very young man of whose wilful character i have heard so many speak forgive me my friend for having spoken of you as a scapegrace how could i imagine that you who as a boy were so wild and disobedient would have become a quiet and pious man as you seem to me to be yes thank god said the captain in a voice trembling with emotion he has at length after many hard trials and severe chastements shown me the error of my ways and guided my feet into the way of peace but pray excuse my speaking more on the subject just now i could scarcely relate all the details of my long story to-night and fatigued as i am it would be too much for me indeed as it is the idea of passing the night under your roof almost overcomes me for this is the very house that i was born in and here too my parents both died notwithstanding his anxiety to hear a full account of the extraordinary events in the life of his guest the worthy pastor considerably forbore to touch on the subject again during the evening as to the children they did not cease to pay the greatest attention hoping to hear at least something interesting but in vain the captain sat buried in thought and during the short time before supper scarcely spoke a word directly after supper the pastor read a chapter from the bible and made a short evening prayer and then the children had to go to bed this seemed to them a greater hardship to-night than it had ever done before and they could not help thinking as they went upstairs that perhaps the captain might relate his adventures after they had gone and so they should miss hearing them they kept all these thoughts to themselves however for they were good obedient children and went to bed without murmuring after they had left the room the captain still refrained from speaking on the subject of his travels 
only telling the pastor of his intention of spending the rest of his life in his native village if he could find a suitable house either to rent or buy his host heard this resolution with pleasure and told him that there was a neat comfortable cottage close by his own parsonage which was for sale it had belonged to a forester who had died about six months ago and would he thought be very likely to suit him they continued talking on various subjects for some little time till the pastor's wife reminded them that it was past ten o'clock upon this they went up to bed but for nearly an hour afterwards the pastor heard his guest who slept in an adjoining room walking up and down and occasionally praying in a loud voice after a time however all was silent and peaceful sleep closed the labors of the day the next morning the two children were the first downstairs they had always been accustomed to get up early and little willie when only four years old once said to his father isn't it a shame papa to let the sun get up before we do he must be more tired than we are for he has such a long way to go every day their father usually employed the first part of the morning in taking them both out for a walk either up the mountains or in the fields or perhaps into the forest where they would gather ferns or flowers and get him to tell them their names but to-day they seemed so anxious to hear the captain's adventures that they did not like to go out far for fear they might miss some opportunity of hearing his story and they could scarcely contain their joy when their mother told them that he was not going to leave don bock that was the name of the village but was going to live at the forester's house in a retired country village like Dornbach, where everything went on from one week's end to another in the same quiet manner it was rarely indeed that anything occurred to furnish the villagers with a new topic of conversation and every traveller who stopped at the roadside inn if it were only to bait his horse created quite a sensation if the stranger should happen to get into conversation with any one for the next three days at least every one in the place would be talking about him this was specially the case now when the report was spread that the captain of a ship had arrived at the parsonage not for a passing visit but with the intention of settling in the neighborhood and when it was further reported that this old captain was no other than the much talked of son of the late pastor buchanan well remembered by the older inhabitants of the scapegrace the excitement of the good people of dornbach was immense this was now the subject of everybody's conversation the people all seemed to have forgotten their ordinary occupations everywhere they were seen to be gathered together in groups talking about the news of the day of which however as yet they knew very little oh yes i have seen him said old hannah i saw him yesterday when he first came to the village is he not very rich asked another of course he is says frau margaret how can he be otherwise if he is really the captain of a ship i'm sure he must have a million of money a million of money muttered the old bailiff if he had half as much as that he would never think of shutting himself up in an out-of-the-way village like this if he had twice as much said old father nicholas with an air of irony he would not have it long if he is anything like what he used to be ah uh, i remember him well 
I was at school with him, and if ever there was a spendthrift in the world, one who did not even seem to know there was such a word as save, believe me, he is the man. In short, everyone had something to say on the subject, in spite of the fact that no one knew anything about it, and after a great deal had been said, they came to the conclusion that there was nothing for it but to wait and see what would happen. While all this was going on in the village, the captain had sent down to the inn at Arbroch, where he had left his luggage, and ordered it to be sent to Dornbach, to his new house, which the bailiff had put into good repair for him. He had also borrowed some necessary furniture from his good friend the pastor, until he could get some of his own from the neighboring town. When the cart arrived with his boxes and portmanteaus in it, the curiosity of the villagers received a fresh impetus. "'What can he have in that strong-looking box?' said one. "'If it were money, two men could never carry it. And look what a number of packages besides. I can't think what a single man would want with so much luggage.' how do you know he is single answered another he may for all we know have a wife and family who will come down here when the house is ready for them well well perhaps that is it said a third who stood opposite we must wait and see willie and his sister mary were quite as curious as any one else and kept asking their papa what all those boxes contain i really do not know was his answer perhaps when he has unpacked them he will show you some day if you are good children the captain soon set to work unpacking but for more than a week he did not ask any of his friends to go and look at his treasures even the old servant whom he engaged was not allowed to go into the room where most of his boxes were, so that for a time everyone's curiosity remained unsatisfied. As it was only a few steps through his garden, which joined that of the pastor, to the parsonage, he had made arrangements with the pastor's wife to dine with them regularly, so that he might not be troubled with the duties of housekeeping. End of chapter 2 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 3 of The Captain's Story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Captain's Story by William S. Martin. Chapter 3 Now stir the fire and close the shutters fast. Let fall the curtains, wheel the sofa round. And while the bubbling and loud hissing urn throws up a steamy column and the cups that cheer but not inebriate wait on each so let's welcome peaceful evening in cooper one evening a little more than a week after the captain had moved into the forester's house he invited the pastor and his wife and the two children to go and take tea with him on arriving at the house they were shown at once into the room which had been kept so securely locked up since the luggage had arrived and were delighted at seeing the result of his labors the children too were much amused with looking at some tapestry which covered one of the walls 
representing three black slaves in the act of handing coffee and refreshments to the visitors these were as large as life and so well done that at first the children were quite frightened believing them to be real negroes when they were all seated the captain gave them some genuine and very rare tea served in fine porcelain cups which he had brought from china and also some nice preserved fruits and sweetmeats from the indies the room was quite full of curiosities of all kinds and the pastor's wife was much interested in looking at some beautiful silks from the levant and several curiously carved boxes containing spices from the molucca islands and also coffee and coca berries cotton pods and specimens of many other useful articles which in their prepared state were well known to her the chief attraction for the pastor and the two children was a fine collection of objects of natural history which the captain had already found time to put in order there were some stuffed birds from foreign countries which the captain had shot and several cases containing a great many splendid butterflies from brazil they saw also hanging on the walls of the room wooden spears and roughly made axes with bows and arrows and other weapons used by the savages of different countries which their host had visited on the mantelpiece too were some lumps of amber from the black sea porphyry from the ruins of carthage large shells and fine pieces of coral agate and many other curiosities from the sea beside the large shells on the mantelpiece there was a beautiful collection of smaller ones in a small cabinet on the sideboard in another cabinet which was made of ebony and handsomely inlaid with mother of pearl and silver they were shown a valuable assortment of precious stones from persia and the indies the delight of the children when they saw all these curiosities was unbounded and they asked so many questions first about one thing they saw and then about another that it was impossible for the captain to satisfy their curiosity in one evening when the time came for them to go home they were very sorry but were consoled by the hope of often visiting their kind friend and getting him to tell them all about his different treasures after this first visit the children were often allowed to go over to see the captain and each time they did so he had something new to surprise them with either some curiosity to show them or perhaps a long and interesting story to tell them about some of the foreign countries he had visited sometimes too he would let them read to him out of a little book full of pretty stories and fables which he had brought and then he would explain to them all that they read one day they had been reading the fable of the grasshopper and the ant in which the grasshopper is represented as blaming the ant for working so hard during the fine summer weather instead of enjoying the bright sunshine and leaving the future to take care of itself the ant replies that she knows it is very pleasant to have nothing to do but to play and sing among the grass and the flowers but instinct has taught her that the bright warm weather must in time be exchanged for cold gloomy days with frost and snow when no food is to be got and so she is seeking while she has an opportunity to lay up a store against a rainy day the captain asked little mary if she knew what was meant by the grasshopper in the fable i don't know was her answer 
but i think it must mean a man yes my dear said he it does represent a man but what sort of a man perhaps willie can tell us i suppose said willie after thinking a little while that the grasshopper in the fable intended to represent those people who live without any care for the future and who when they have plenty of everything around them forget that a time may come when they will not be able to work and who never lay up anything for their future wants that is quite right said the captain and we may learn too from this fable to make a good use of our opportunities while we have them not only to lay by money as a provision for old age but while we are young to try by diligence and study to lay in a store of useful knowledge and above all to remember our creator in the days of our youth instead of leaving it to an old age which we may never live to see end of chapter three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter four of the captain's story this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the captain's story by william s martin chapter four in all my wanderings round this world of care in all my griefs and god has given my share i still had hopes my latest hours to crown amidst these humble bowers to lay me down around my fire an evening group to draw and tell of all i felt and all i saw goldsmith every time the pastor went to see the captain he could not help noticing that his eyes were very often fixed on a portrait which hung just over the looking-glass and he noticed too that whenever he was looking at it his eyes were filled with tears at first from a feeling of delicacy he did not like to ask him the cause of this but at length he thought that his title of friend added to that of pastor made it his duty to endeavor to free his friend from the burden of some unhappy memory under which he was evidently laboring one day then when he found him alone he said to him my dear friend how is it that you are always gazing at the portrait with such an expression of sadness on your countenance oh my dear pastor exclaimed the captain your question touches the spring of all my grief even now that all my wanderings are over and i am settled down here leading such a peaceful quiet life in my native village how can i be happy when every moment the memory of him who face you see there comes up before my mind whose portrait is it then asked the pastor it is my father's was the reply but for you to fully understand my feelings when i think of him you must know something of my history and as the present is a good opportunity i will relate my story to you and to your family i should like you all to know what troubles i have passed through the pastor's wife and children did not want asking twice to come and listen to the captain's adventures which they had so long been hoping and longing to hear when they had all come and were seated he began his story i was as you know born in this village in the year seventeen 
shortly after my birth my mother died leaving me her only child to my father's care he sadly distressed at her loss resolved never to marry again he was a pious and very learned man and as i grew up he took great pains to instruct me in the fear of god but his periodical duties and his studies prevented him from having me constantly under his own eye i was indeed left in a great measure to the care of an old aunt who was very deaf and whose weak easy good nature could not restrain my naturally headstrong disposition so that i had no lack of opportunities for disobeying my father's commands and satisfying my own taste for amusements of which he did not approve i never found any difficulty in learning and indeed could always get my tasks done long before the time i had to say them so that i had a great deal of spare time on my hands which i used to spend in the streets playing with the little boys of the village who taught me a great many bad habits whenever i was found out it is true i was severely punished and for a little while was more sharply looked after but i too often managed to deceive my father and did not hesitate even at falsehoods in order to be able to follow the bend of my own bad disposition my father had intended that i should become a pastor like himself my taste however was rather for a life of travels but i dared not set up my will in opposition to his and in my eighteenth year i left his house and entered the university of Giessen. the liberty which the students there enjoyed pleased me amazingly and i endeavored to avail myself of it to the utmost i studied however with great diligence and my natural aptitude for learning always left me plenty of time to devote to pleasure little by little i found my studies became irksome to me and my desire for amusement increased until at length i entirely gave up all serious occupations and used to pass all my time either in pleasure parties or in the public house before i left home my bad behavior gained for me the name of scapegrace and at the university i did my best to show myself worthy of the title it was not long before my father was informed of my disorderly conduct and you can understand what impression such a report made upon him he wrote me a most affectionate letter full of the most touching exhortations to give up my evil course this at the time sensibly moved me and made me seriously resolve to turn over a new leaf soon however my love of pleasure aided by the influence of bad companions made me break through all my good resolutions i was ashamed of what my associates called my weakness and i soon fell lower than ever oh how deeply has the experience of that time proved to me the truth of that saying of an old french writer the being ashamed of what is right is the root and source of all our misery when my father saw that all his exhortations were without effect and all my promises without any result he tried the plan of refusing to send me any more money hoping that the want of means to indulge my bad habits would bring me back to a better frame of mind this plan however was far from being successful i soon got into debt and when at last no one would trust me any longer 
I sold my books and every article of value that I had, and getting on the coach, I resolved to make my way to Amsterdam and go to sea. The journey to Amsterdam suited me very well, for I found most of my traveling companions were young men of about my own stamp, and with them I passed the time pleasantly enough. Over and over again, I repeated to myself the foolish wish, oh, that I could be always as happy as I am now. End of chapter 4 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 5 of The Captain's Story this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Captain's Story by Williams S. Martin. Chapter 5 thorns and snares are in the way of the forward he that doth keep his soul shall be far from them proverbs twenty two five before quitting geeson i had written to my father to tell him of my resolution and i had also the effrontery to ask him to send me some money he was you may be sure deeply grieved on receiving such a letter but when i reached amsterdam i found an answer from him in which he enclosed twenty pounds the letter contained the most earnest and affectionate exhortations to me to return and repent assuring me of his willingness to forgive me if i did so if however in spite of all he could say i should refuse and still persist in my mad and wicked course he added my curse shall be upon you and follow you always i was much agitated by these terrible words and i seriously thought when i read them that i dared not go on but whether it was that i was ashamed to go back or from my desire to travel about the world or the idea that such a threat uttered i was sure in a moment of anger would never be fulfilled i hardened my heart against my better feelings and obstinately persisted in the course i had chosen alas how soon was i to know by bitter experience the terrible effects of a father's curse however i strove to dismiss all such thoughts from my mind and went down to the quay with all my money nearly thirty pounds in my pocket to look out for a ship about to sail either for north america or the indies i was not very particular which my great desire being to get to sea as soon as possible and then i thought my happiness will begin having heard that there was a fine vessel then loading for surinam i took a boat and went on board to see the captain but i soon found my means were insufficient for such a long voyage and returned from the ship quite low-spirited this may seem strange but it is a fact that whenever we are doing wrong willfully and pursuing any course which our conscience cannot approve the slightest repulse is sufficient to cause us great uneasiness and any little hindrance we may meet with which at another time we should think nothing of is then enough to make us quite unhappy this was the case with me and i felt very miserable as i was walking up and down the quay the course i had chosen was one of disobedience and sin and i was realizing the truth of the words there is no peace 
to the wicked i had been walking up and down for nearly a quarter of an hour in this way when on raising my eyes i noticed a well-dressed young man apparently waiting to speak to me when i got near him he bowed politely and addressed me in german excuse me sir but you seem to be a stranger in this town and if i am not mistaken a german i am also quite a stranger here and i am rejoiced to meet with a fellow countryman i was very glad to hear this and assured him of the pleasure i felt at meeting him and thus we soon got into conversation together when he heard that i intended to go abroad and thought of going to north america he seemed agreeably surprised and told me that he had just engaged a passage to new york in a vessel which was to sail the next day and added if you like i can take you to the captain's house for i think he has room for another passenger and on our way we can see the vessel which is not far from here i thanked him for his kind offer and we walked arm in arm down the quay where he soon showed me the ship riding at anchor she was a fine vessel newly painted and looking very trim and neat it seemed a very long way to the captain's house and i am sure we must have gone more than a mile together before we got there my new friend seemed to know the house well and led me down several passages to a little room at the back of the premises where he left me telling me he would go and call the captain as he went out i heard a slight grating noise as though he had locked the door after him and though i quite laughed at the idea yet after waiting impatiently for nearly half an hour for the captain to come i thought i would just look up and down the passage and see if i could find any one who would tell me where he was on reaching the door you may imagine my consultation at finding it was indeed locked horror seized me for i found i was like a mouse caught in a trap i flew to the window and found it was securely nailed down and then saw what i had not noticed before that it was guarded outside by stout iron bars now i began to realize the situation i was in and concluded that i was the victim of one of those crimps or kidnappers who in those times infested seaport towns and as i had read used all manner of artifices to decoy unwary travellers into their dens in order to rob them and then sell them into the military service of some distant colony this thought almost drove me frantic i tore my hair and wrung my hands and stamped on the floor with my feet i screamed and called for help but all in vain my prison was too well chosen for my cries to reach any but the persons of the house and after an hour spent in vain endeavors to escape i sank exhausted into a chair and sullenly awaited my fate after waiting about two hours as it seemed to me in this terrible state of rage grief and despair i heard the door unlocked and prepared myself to make one desperate effort for my liberty the door was thrown open and i felt my last chance of escape was gone when i saw two men enter with pistols loaded and cocked in their hands they soon compelled me by threats of instant death if i resisted to hand over all my money to them and then i was obliged to change my clothes for a very dirty sailor's dress which one of them had brought with him they were deaf to all my entreaties for pity and though i wept and besought them to let me go 
even if they took all i had from me and promised them a liberal reward it was all in vain they took no notice whatever of my complaints and merely putting down some bread and cheese and a mug of water on the table they gathered up all my clothes and left me to my own reflections when night came on i was again aroused and taken out of the house by a back door and conveyed on board a ship where i found several other young men who i concluded from their melancholy and dejected air were in a similar predicament to myself our captors were too numerous and well armed for resistance to be of any avail and as i could see that anything of the kind must only end in making our situation still worse than it was i made up my mind to suffer all my misery as patiently as i could as long as we were in sight of the land we were kept down in the hold and carefully guarded day and night by our men and i was quite thankful when we got well out to sea and were allowed to go on deck we soon found however that our masters had no intention of letting us be idle during the voyage for we were kept constantly employed about the ship and made to do all the hardest and dirtiest work this was very distasteful to me with my lazy habits for i had never done a day's hard work before in my life and latterly even study had been quite irksome to me the curse with which my father had pronounced upon me had already begun to be terribly fulfilled and i now began to believe that it was indeed to follow me always End of chapter 5 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 6 of The Captain's Story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the captain's story by william s martin chapter five colder and louder blew the wind a gale from the northeast the snow fell hissing in the brine and the billows froth like yeast down came the storm and smote amain the vessel in its strength she shuddered and paused like a frighted steed then leapt her cable's length longfellow when i was at the university i indeed became accustomed to low society but when i came to hear the conversation of some of the sailors on board my hair stood on end with horror i would have given anything to have been employed in some way so that i might have avoided hearing all day long the terrible oaths of these wicked men compared with whom i seemed to myself to be a very model of excellence but as i had neglected the study of mathematics when i had the opportunity i had not sufficient knowledge of the principles of navigation to be employed in anything but manual labor our ship was freighted for batavia so that i had no hope of any change for the better in my miserable condition for a long time and my wretchedness reached its height when i was told that on our arrival i should be compelled to join a regiment of dutch troops no life indeed could be less to my taste than that of a soldier on account of the strict discipline which is always enforced in the army it was however decreed that we should never reach our destination soon after we crossed the line 
a sudden and violent gale drove our vessel out of her course and for two days and nights we were driving at the mercy of the wind no sooner had we succeeded in making some little way against this gale than a violent tempest arose and we were obliged to devote all our attention to saving the ship around the ship the sea and sky were enveloped in thick darkness broken by repeated flashes of lightning which served only to show us the danger of our position at one moment the vessel rose on the tops of the immense mountain-like waves and the instant after plunged down into a vast hollow leaving the water standing up around us like a wall while one party of the sailors were trying in vain to furl the sails the rest were kept busy at work at the pumps by this time the hold was half full of water and every moment we were expecting the ship to go to pieces as her timbers were too old and rotten to bear the strain upon them soon we lost all hope of saving the ship and the crew ceased making any further exertions every one seeking for some means of saving his own life the vessel then began to settle deeper and deeper in the water and soon after disappeared beneath the waves before this however i had thrown myself into the sea and was then clinging to a part of the mast which had been washed away several of the crew beside myself had sought for safety in a similar way but when the sky grew a little lighter and i was able to look around me i could see no one i seemed to be the only survivor the storm continued to rage furiously all night and it was with difficulty that i managed to keep on the slippery spar which was now my only support all night long amid the howling of the tempest i seemed to hear my father's words ringing in my ears i tried to pray but remorse was busy in my heart and conscience kept repeating to me why did you not return to your father like the prodigal son when you knew he was ready to forgive you and to receive you with outstretched arms at length this terrible night the longest i have ever passed through came to an end and when at last daylight returned i was very thankful to see close by me a large rock which i managed to reach though not without great difficulty benumbed as i was with passing the night in the water i clung eagerly to it and after resting a while dragged my weary limbs as high above the water as i could and gazed eagerly out over the wide expanse of sea for a long time however i looked in vain for any signs of help but at length to my great joy i descried a sail far away in the distance apparently making towards me i was so weak and faint with my long immersion that although this sight seemed to put a new life in me it was as much as i could do to clamber up to the top of the rock and my hands and feet were much cut by the sharp shells and edges of rock i scarcely noticed this so great was my eagerness to make a signal to the ship i had seen and to let those on board know that on this solitary reef there was a poor shipwrecked mariner i had of course no means of making a fire so i at once pulled off my shirt and waved it in the air as the only way i had to make myself seen all was in vain the ship was too far off to notice my signal and instead of coming nearer as i had hoped she tacked round on another course and gradually disappeared in the distance as the vessel slowly faded away from my sight i sank down on the rock in despair my situation was indeed desperate 
the small rock on which i was was only about fifty yards in circumference and had nothing but a little moss and seaweed growing on it it is true there were a few shellfish clinging to it but i knew it would be impossible for me to support myself long on them and besides i had not a drop of water i feared that i had only escaped death by drowning to perish more miserably still by starvation but even in this extremity god's goodness was watching over me although i had so long despised and forgotten him suddenly a breeze sprang up from the westward and i had the unspeakable joy of seeing the very ship which had passed in the morning heave in sight once more again i waved my shirt in the air and made every signal i could think of and after a long time what was my delight to see that i was observed a boat was soon lowered and half an hour afterwards i found myself on board the good ship morning star homeward bound to england from india the captain received me very kindly and supplied me with some dry clothes giving me at the same time a good meal of which i stood much in need the anxiety and exposure i had undergone however made me quite ill and for three or four days i was under the doctor's care on my recovery i was obliged to work my passage home and this employment became so distasteful to me that i quite lost all my love of roving and made up my mind if once i got safely on shore never again to set foot on board a ship end of chapter six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter seven of the captain's story this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the captain's story by william s martin chapter seven wild is the whirlwind rolling o'er afric's sandy plain and wild the tempest howling along the billowed main but every danger felt before the raging deep the whirlwind's roar less dreadful struck me with dismay than what i feel this fatal day goldsmith after a favourable voyage we arrived at portsmouth to which port the ship was bound i took leave of the captain to seek my fortune elsewhere he wished me good luck and paid me my wages for the homeward passage which however did not last me long finding myself again penniless and without any means of earning my living i resolved to return to my father accordingly i shipped as a common sailor on board a bark bound for holland we had beautiful weather and after a very good passage i landed at rotterdam it was early on a sunday morning and as there was no business connected with the ship to prevent me i thought i could not do less than go to church and there give thanks to god for the great deliverance he had given me this will show that the dangers through which i had passed and the experience i had gained had not been without some influence on the state of my soul i had become more serious my outward conduct at least was much improved but notwithstanding this i had as yet experienced no real change of heart had i but fully realized the meaning of the sermon i heard that day i should have felt that something more than this was necessary a real inward purification and a complete renunciation even in thought of the sins which had led me astray one part of the discourse ran thus god regards not only those things which a man does not only his outward actions his eye can also see our inmost thoughts and he knows the true motive of every action of our lives he regards not the outward appearance but the inner reality not the shell but the kernel that is the inmost feeling and disposition of the heart 
the shell is only the outward act he sees the grain and not the husk only the treasure not the box which contains it the sword and not the scabbard which hides it from our less penetrating view what can it avail to have the scabbard ornamented with gold and jewels if in the day of battle the sword is found edgeless and covered with rust who would value a crop however fine it might look as it stands in the field if all the ears of corn were blighted and withered doubtless it is well that our outward actions should be of the highest and noblest character that is indeed the sign of a well-regulated and religious life but only truly are they such when they proceed from pure and noble motives and are the expression of sound principles within the same day i wrote to my father again and told him how i was situated i assured him of my true repentance and begged him to send me sufficient money to enable me to return to him but while waiting to hear from him i had only about two shillings in my pocket and this was entirely gone by wednesday i knew his reply could not reach me for four days and in the meantime i had not a penny to pay for board and lodging i would not beg though my circumstances were really worse than those of the poorest beggar in the streets and i had not then that faith and trust in our heavenly father's care which i have since through his mercy been enabled to feel i knew not as yet what it was to be a child of god i determined however to bear my hunger till some relief arrived from my father all day on friday i had literally nothing to eat and by saturday night i felt weak and ill in the extreme and still those words of my father were ringing in my ears my curse shall be upon you i had long lived in abundance and squandered away pounds upon pounds now i was to know by experience what it is to be in want in this pitiable condition having no means of obtaining a lodging i crept under a boat hauled up on the beach for the night and obtained a few hours forgetfulness of my misery when i awoke i felt very wretched and low-spirited but remembering that this was sunday i determined to go to church again and listen to another sermon hoping to hear something there that might afford me some comfort my hope was not in vain the minister spoke most feelingly of the love of god and of the care which he takes of all his creatures his text and the explanation he gave of it seemed so exactly suited to my own case that i almost thought the preacher must have known my circumstances and chosen it expressly for my benefit i was much affected and on my return i wrote on a sheet of paper which i have ever since carefully preserved the following passages which seemed peculiarly applicable to my own case the text was from st matthew chapter six verse twenty six behold the fowls of the air yes consider them attentively for even they can teach us a lesson how beautiful they are how lively and active in all their motions they of all created things seem specially adapted to give delight to the eye of man by their brilliant plumage and graceful evolutions and to charm the ears by their melodious songs their homes are in the tops of the highest trees they wing their course far above our heads and indeed seem to belong more to heaven than to earth let us consider now what we are told about them in the text they sow not neither do they reap they are in fact utterly ignorant of the fact that an ear of corn sown carefully in the ground would in due season bring forth sixty or a hundredfold they see the berries and the corn about the growth of which they have never troubled themselves and there they find enough for their daily wants their free and joyous spirits seem to have no care for the future they never gather into barns how many animals are otherwise look at the squirrel with his hoard of nuts the bees with their rich provision of honey the careful ants and many others whose foresight teaches them to provide against the season of scarcity these too are all the creatures of god and his tender mercy is over all his works but how different is the life from that of the birds singing and rejoicing seems the sole end and aim of their life their songs and all their joyous motions in the air are like a perpetual hymn of praise and thanksgiving to god by whose providence they are sustained 
your heavenly father feedeth them is he indeed the father of the ravens is he indeed the father of the sparrows only as much as he is their creator and the supplier of their wants but to you my friends to you he is more than this to you indeed he is a father the true and loving father of all who hear his words and remember his commandments to do them oh let us not forget all his benefits let us remember that from him alone we have all the blessings we enjoy all blessings both of body and soul but above all let us thank him for the unspeakable gift of his dear son jesus christ for our redemption and of his holy spirit for the renewal of our hearts and oh as we think over all his benefits as did david when he penned the one hundred and third psalm must not all that is within us bless his holy name and whatever his providence may send us whether wealth or poverty sickness or health let us look up to him with thankfulness for his mercy and say doubtless thou art our father behold the fowls of the air their work indeed seems to be only singing and rejoicing but what is yours are ye not much better than they you who are the children of god heirs of god and joint heirs with christ who are strangers and pilgrims in this world of sorrow and suffering but whose home is in heaven you for whom god hath prepared an eternal mansion in the kingdom of heaven to which indeed you shall one day go to enjoy bliss unspeakable and full of glory if only while here below you walk as children of the light and trust in that great salvation which christ accomplished for you by his life and by his death are ye not indeed much better than they here willie interrupted the captain's story by asking why then are we taught in the fable to blame the careless and improvident grasshopper for not laying up a store for the winter when the birds are praised for living without troubling themselves about the future i can't quite understand this his father answered him all animals my dear boy follow the instinct which god has implanted in them it is not for us to blame them or to praise them but at the same time they may be used as examples to us so far as we find in each anything good lovable or useful and one and all may be employed to illustrate the characters of different men from the ant for instance the idle may learn to work and the careless to save do you remember who says go to the ant thou sluggard consider her ways and be wise so on the other hand from the birds the covetous and over anxious may learn that it is possible to live however scanty our store may be if we only have faith in our heavenly father's care it is wrong to be too anxious and troubled about the things of this world while at the same time we must avoid falling into the opposite error of carelessness idleness and improvidence then turning to the captain he said excuse our interrupting you my dear friend pray continue your story the captain then resumed his narrative in these words the pastor's sermon seemed to console me very much and gave me fresh courage and i thought to myself i am it is true a stranger in this large city without money or friends but there is one above who knows my pitiable condition his eye is upon me and if it seem good to him he can easily feed me this one day at least as he feeds the young ravens who cry unto him soon after leaving the church i noticed a young man whose features seemed well known to me reading the latin inscription on the monument to erasmus which stands in the middle of the market-place for some minutes i could not remember clearly who he was or where i had met him before but all of a sudden i recognised him as an old fellow-student at the university of gießen and stepping up to him i held up my hand saying "Corbeck, is it you that is my name said he staring at me but i can't say i recollect you i then remembered that what with my sailor's dress my famished appearance and my bronzed and weather-beaten features it was scarcely likely that any of my old companions would know me at first sight i soon told him who i was and he recollected me at once and shook me heartily by the hand i had no need to tell him i was hungry my appearance sufficiently showed that and he considerately spared me the shame and pain of asking him for relief by taking me to an inn close by 
here a good dinner was quickly provided for me and i need scarcely say i ate with the ravenous appetite of an almost starving man as soon as i had satisfied my hunger i told him some of my adventures he saw at once that i was in need of further help but as he was just about to join a ship to which he had been appointed surgeon he had need of all his money and was only able to give me a few shillings these i accepted with gratitude and was very glad to be in a position to pay for a night's lodging thus god who filleth all things living with plenteousness supplied me with the necessaries of life as soon as i began to trust to his care even before i had learned truly to know him he dealt with me as though i were one of his faithful children oh that i had been able to recognize this love to me but as soon as i found my distress relieved i thought no more of his love who had helped me and very soon fell again into my former state of indifference the money my friend had given me was almost all gone when on the following wednesday a letter reached me not indeed from my father but from one of my uncles who told me that my father was dead and that what little property he had left had been barely sufficient to pay off my university debts the letter also contained an order for five pounds which my uncle sent me without however telling me whether i was expected to return home or whether i was free to continue my wandering life on reading the sad news of my father's death i fell into a chair and covered my face with my hands i seemed again to hear those terrible words my curse shall be upon you and i was for a long time unable to utter a word or to shed a single tear at length however my grief found vent and i passed the greater part of the night in bitter and passionate weeping when the day broke my troubles began again and the future now looked to me blacker than ever what was i to do whither should i direct my steps whatever i undertake i thought i can never escape the terrible curse which i have brought upon myself by my disobedience my father is dead and it is now too late to obtain his forgiveness oh what would i have given to have seen him alive once more i would have thrown myself at his feet and on my knees have sought his pardon for my wickedness until he exchanged his curse for a blessing but now alas it is too late too late reproaching myself thus i at last made up my mind that it would be useless now to return to my old home and that the only course open to me was to go to sea again and i determined to go and offer myself as a sailor on board the ship in which i had come over the captain received me very kindly and engaged me as their mate promising at the same time to teach me something of navigation we soon set sail and before we had been very long at sea the second mate who had been drinking too much fell overboard it was dark at the time and there was a heavy sea on and though the boats were lowered no traces of him were discovered as i had in that short time paid great attention to my duties and to the kind instructions of the captain i was promoted to his place the next voyage i was made first mate and some years later i became captain of a ship bound for peru and continued in that capacity for about ten years during this time i had a good opportunity for making private speculations which proved so successful that at the end of the ten years i was able to buy a ship of my own while i was thus busily engaged i had little time to think of my father and his last letter to me and so long as i continued in prosperity i neglected prayer altogether yet i passed before all the world for an honest man and judged only by my outward acts no one would have doubted that i was a god-fearing one End of chapter 7chapter eight of the captain's story this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the captain's story by william s martin chapter eight god moves in a mysterious way 
his wonders to perform he plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm deep in unfathomable mines of never failing skill he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will judge not the lord by feeble sense but trust him for his grace behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face cooper about this time too i had got married being then about thirty-five years of age this was at liverpool and after the ceremony was over i called at the clergyman's house to get a certificate while he was writing it out for me i looked round the room and saw hanging on a wall that very portrait which you see over the looking-glass i started back with astonishment and began trembling violently so much so indeed that i was obliged to support myself by holding on to the table the clergyman asked me what was the matter oh nothing nothing at all it is only an attack of giddiness said i with my eyes still riveted on the portrait i seem to see my father alive before me with his eyes fixed upon me in anger and in my agitation i even fancied i saw the lips of the picture move and thought i again heard those terrible words my curse shall be upon you and follow you always no no i cried out loud being unable to overcome my terror oh do not do not curse me the clergyman filled with astonishment asked me the cause of so strange an exclamation i confess that it was the portrait of my father and my meeting with it so unexpectedly which had produced so strong an impression upon me upon this he took down the picture and showed me by the name on the back that i was mistaken in thinking it was my father's portrait it being that of an english clergyman who had been dead for some years so that the resemblance was quite accidental he spoke also very kindly to me about the words i had used and gradually led me to tell him the story of my disobedience and my father's anger and took much pains to convince me that my father's curse could not exercise any unfavorable influence upon me if i had truly repented of those sins which provoked him to utter it and if as a proof of my sincerity i were now living a different life all his arguments however failed to quiet my conscience and i returned to my house much troubled in mind shortly after this i set out for another voyage but my late good fortune seemed to have deserted me we met with very rough weather before we had been a month at sea and in order to save the ship i was obliged to order a great part of the cargo to be thrown overboard so that when at length we arrived at our destination i found i had lost several hundred pounds on the voyage the homeward voyage was equally unfortunate and when after nearly twelve months absence i reached my home and found my dear wife ready to welcome me with our baby in her arms the joy of such a meeting was marred by the fear of the punishment of my disobedience might fall on the heads of those i loved i have little to tell you about the next six or seven years during which time my bad fortune still followed me and the state of my affairs grew gradually worse and worse one thing however i must relate i had been out one afternoon for a walk and on returning just at dusk i found a poor miserable-looking beggar with a wooden leg sitting on the grass near our cottage door eating some food which my wife had just given him i said a few words to him when i came up and as some of his answers interested me 
I asked him to stop a little while and give me an account of himself. He began, I was born at Amsterdam, and in a moment I recollected him. He was no other than the very crimp whom I met on the quay when I first went to that city, and who had decoyed me into his house, where I was robbed and sent to sea, as I have told you. I said nothing, however, but let him go on with his story. He told me that he had been once in business, but had met with so many losses that at length he was obliged to go as a sailor in the English navy, and that during an engagement he had received a bullet in his left leg, which had to be amputated, so that when he received his discharge he was compelled to get his living as he could. While he was speaking, a thousand recollections crowded on my mind, and when he had finished I fixed my eyes sternly on his face and said, Do you remember me? He said he had no recollection of ever seeing me before. Thereupon I told him the story of our meeting on the quay in Amsterdam, and reminded him of what had followed his treachery. As I spoke somewhat loudly and angrily, he became quite pale with terror, and did not attempt to deny that he was the man who had used me so cruelly. In fact, he seemed quite paralyzed with fright. "'Don't be afraid of me,' I said. "'God himself has punished your wickedness, and I will not revenge myself on you. Only take yourself off from hence, and never let me see you again.' The captain here broke off to ask the children whether they thought he had done well in acting thus. "'Oh, yes, certainly,' said Mary, you were surely right not to be revenged upon him. That is true, said Willie, but the Bible says we are to love our enemies, and I think, sir, if you had loved this man, you would not have driven him away from you. Quite true, my boy, rejoined the captain, and if I had followed the example of our blessed Saviour, I should have tried to help this man out of his troubles, and endeavoured to obtain some influence over his heart, and so have been really useful to him by leading him to see how wicked he had been. But I could not do it. I did not even know my own heart, and I thought I was doing a wonderfully good action in not punishing him for his cruelty and inhumanity towards me. I live many years longer holding this good opinion of myself, until God gave me the grace of humility, and brought me by means of more troubles to know the wickedness of my own heart. As my affairs became gradually more and more embarrassed, I was often very much troubled on account of my children, of whom I now, too, for during these few years all my savings had been expended, and I could not see my way clearly to provide for their education as they grew up. Their promising dispositions were, however, a source of great satisfaction to me, and I comforted myself with the hope that things might yet soon approve with me, and that one or two successful voyages would place me in a position to provide for all their wants. With my mind thus filled with mingled feelings of joy at my safe return to my family, and anxiety for future welfare of those dependent upon me, I returned one day late in summer of seventeen, after three months' voyage. I had written to my wife a few days before to tell her when I should be home. But having got into port a day earlier than I reckoned upon, I anticipated giving my wife and children a pleasant surprise by my unexpected arrival. Even at this distance of time, I can scarcely trust myself to speak of the terrible disappointment that awaited me. 
on entering my college on entering my cottage instead of being greeted with the affectionate caresses of my dear wife and children i was surprised to see that the only person in the room was a good woman who lived in a neighboring cottage as she looked up and recognized me on my entrance something in her manner made me fear that all was not well with my family i eagerly inquired after them and the woman who was an old friend of my wife's burst into tears and in a few words told me the extent of the misfortune that had befallen me my two children for whose welfare i had been so anxious were both dead and my poor wife was confined to her bed by illness i learned afterwards for i was so overcome by the news of this awful calamity that i could not listen to the particulars just then that the two little ones had gone down to the seashore to play with a little companion about a fortnight before i reached home the last time they were seen alive they were amusing themselves in one of the fishermen's boats which was lying upon the beach by some means or another they must have got the boat afloat and so been carried out to sea unobserved the night proved very stormy and the next day the boat was seen floating bottom upwards out at sea and during the day their dead bodies were washed ashore the anxiety of my poor wife during that awful night and her great agony of sorrow on learning their unhappy faith had preyed so much upon her health that it was scarcely expected that she would ever recover from the shock i pass over the events of the next few days it would be too much for me even now to enter into any detail of the meeting between my wife and myself nor can i without tears think of her as i watch her day by day growing weaker and weaker within a fortnight after my arrival she too followed our children to the grave and i was left alone in the world this surely should have been enough to soften even a heart of stone like mine it was not however i only hardened my heart more and more this is the punishment of my disobedience i thought to myself the concluding words of my father's letter echoed again and again in my ears and instead of producing a good effect upon me only made me more obstinate in refusing to listen to the gentle approach of my saviour if i did not remember but too well my feelings at this time of my life i could not now believe that any poor wretched human being could carry his pride of heart and stubborn rebellion against god to such a pitch as i did in order to divert my mind from the harassing reflections which beset me and made the solitude of my once happy home intolerable instead of bowing to god's holy will and recognizing as i can do now the fact that all that had befallen me was sent in love to my soul by a heavenly father who is too wise to err and too good to be unkind i sought relief where no one ever yet found it by giving myself up to those bad habits which had been the cause of all my misery i spent my whole time in the society of wicked and thoughtless men and turned a deaf ear to the recomstances of my real friends there were many who expressed the deepest sympathy with me in my sorrows and made many vain efforts to recall me to a sense of my duty but i disregarded all their kind exhortations and always answered sullenly what is the use of my trying to do right i am under a curse such a state of things could not last long for the last year or two 
my income had been insufficient to support my family and i had unavoidably contracted some few debts and now my extravagances rapidly increased them my creditors soon began to importune me for payment and after putting them off from time to time i was obliged to tell them that i was utterly and hopelessly bankrupt i was then brought before the court and my ship my house and all my goods were ordered to be sold and these being insufficient to meet the claims against me i was thrown into prison then indeed my cup of sorrow was full again i heard my father's maldiction sounding in my ears and this time without being able to down the painful memory in the riotous pleasures of the world and though in my former troubles i had not shrunk from upbraiding god's providence for oppressing an innocent man as i called myself i could not but feel that this new misfortune was the just consequence of my own folly and extravagance i was now forced to listen to the reproaches of a conscience racked with remorse nevertheless i could not yet resolve to recognize the justice of god i obstinately resisted his appeals and still remained impenitent i cannot tell what i might have become while in prison had i been left altogether to myself all men seemed to have forgotten me entirely but god had not even then deserted me he had found pity on me in my extremity and by an extraordinary dispensation of his providence sent to me that very clergyman in whose house i had seen the portrait which so resembled my father my first words when i saw him were you see i was right my father's curse is following me and you see to what a state it has brought me no replied he this is not the effect of your father's anger it is the consequence of the curse of sin if you had seriously turned to god he whose property is always to have mercy and to forgive who assuredly have delivered you from that curse and would have turned it into a blessing i refused to listen to these words and obstinately persisted in saying that god had doomed me to misery and that nothing could alter my fate take care said the clergyman solemnly that you do not provoke god's anger still more by your rash and inconsiderate words he has surely shown you plainly enough that to rebel against him is the act of none but a madman tell me have you ever tried to free yourself from your load of sin have you ever prayed earnestly for god's help to deliver you out of your troubles no said i i have never tried i cannot do so i am suffering beneath the weight of an unjust curse while thousands of other men who are worse than i am never suffer any punishment at all but prosper in all they undertake my answer to that said the good man must be that you who have studied for the ministry as you told me must know on the authority of god's own word that one single sin is sufficient for a man's condemnation how can you then dare to call your punishment unjust as to your objection that thousands of men are never punished for their offences in this world that can have no weight for even if no punishment reaches them here they cannot escape at the great day of judgment in the world to come you ought rather to thank god for the just chastisement you have received which is proof that his pity and his love 
are not yet wholly withdrawn from you every misfortune you have undergone is as the voice of god calling you to serious repentance remember whom the lord loveth he chasteneth and beware lest by your obstinacy you bring down his wrath upon your head i could not answer such arguments as these but though my reason was convinced my heart was untouched on leaving me the clergyman gave me a new testament and persuaded me to read it with attention and particularly recommended me to meditate prayerfully upon the epistle to the romans he then left me and promised to come and see me again when he had gone i thought to myself there could be very little good in my reading the book he had left me in my university studies i had read it so often that i knew pretty well what it contained and i did not expect to find anything in it that i did not know before accordingly i left it unopened for some days and it was only to divert my melancholy thoughts that i at length for want of anything else to read opened the testament and began to read the epistle to the romans is this indeed the same epistle that i used to read at the university was my first thought when i had read a few verses it was indeed the same word for word there was no alteration in the book but since i last read it i myself had undergone a change since that time i had passed through the rough school of adversity and the experience of years had shown me more than i knew of the corruption of my own heart when i read the words that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before god romans three nineteen i was filled with terror and to this was added an overwhelming sense of the infinite majesty of god whose goodness and justice i had so lately dared to question then i came to the passage for god hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all o oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who hath known the mind of the lord or who hath been his counsellor or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again for of him and through him and to him are all things and to be glory for ever amen romans six thirty two to thirty six upon this a ray of hope dawned upon my heart and i cried out with emotion o god since thou hast mercy on all who come to thee have mercy also on me little by little my heart was softened and tears of true penitence streamed from my eyes i was weeping when the clergyman came to see me again god be praised said he as he entered seeing the tears in my eyes god be praised for he has had compassion on your soul i could not answer for my heart was too full for words he then knelt down with me and prayed with much earnestness that god would carry on the good work he had begun in me and as he prayed i was deeply affected and at last i too called aloud to god for mercy this cry was not in vain the peace of god descended upon my heart 
and i was enabled to believe in the possibility of obtaining pardon for all my sins though faith is a crucified saviour through faith is a crucified saviour after this i found myself in a much happier frame of mind i acknowledged that i had been a miserable sinner and that but for the infinite mercy of the most high i must have perished in my sins i saw now that all my misfortunes had been in reality a token of the loving kindness and tender mercy of him who willeth not the death of a sinner but rather that he should be converted and live the word of god which for so many years had been a dead letter to me had now become a source of sweet and life-giving nourishment to my soul and i spent the greater part of my time while in prison in reading and meditating upon the precious volume the clergyman offered to lend me some other books but i declined them all telling him that the book of books was enough for me after this worthy man had thus attended to my spiritual wants he busied himself in endeavouring to set me free from my unhappy confinement by his exertions and those of several friends whom he had interested in my behalf it was not long before i was set at liberty i was glad to be once more a free man but could not regret my imprisonment inasmuch as it was in the prison that i had been led to a knowledge of him whose service is perfect freedom the kind of friends who had interested themselves in me provided me with a small sum of money which with which i took a little cottage by the seaside and having bought a small boat and some nets i was able to get my living all through the summer as a fisherman and supported myself during the winter by making baskets which i sold in the neighbouring town i begged my good friend the clergyman to give me the portrait so like my father which had caused me such terror when i first saw it in his house but which i could now look upon without distress of mind knowing that i had obtained grace and pardon from my heavenly father on receiving it i hung it up over the fireplace in my humble cottage end of chapter eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter nine of the captain's story this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the captain's story by william s martin chapter nine come peace of mine delightful guest return and make thy downy nest once more in this sad heart nor riches i nor power pursue nor hold forbidden joys in view we therefore need no part cooper the blessing of heaven seemed to rest upon my humble employment and i was not only able to earn sufficient to keep myself but was able to lay buy a little money from time to time so that within two years i saved sufficient to repay my kind friends the money they lent me to start with among those who had interested themselves in my welfare was a rich merchant who was the owner of several ships and on the death of the captain of one of these he wrote to me and offered me the command of it i did not at all like the idea of leaving my peaceful cottage where for nearly two years i had lived a very happy and contented life studying the word of god and rejoicing in his mercy 
but at the same time i did not think it my duty positively to decline such an offer as this without careful consideration in this state of uncertainty i resolved to consult my good friend the clergyman from whom i had no secrets and who had already rendered me so many services i did so and his first question was whether i had really considered the motives which led me to think of accepting the offer and if i was quite sure that i was not influenced by the desire of riches or any contempt for my present humble lot i replied truly that no such idea had ever entered my head i was quite contented and happy in my present employment but i hoped to be able by means of an increased income to pay all my creditors in full and perhaps lay by some provision for my old age satisfied with this explanation he advised me by all means to accept the appointment and added that he himself had induced the merchant to make me the offer having now no longer any doubt as to which was the right course to pursue i let my college to a fisherman and taking the portrait of my father with me i set sail full in confidence on god's protecting care i was now in the mediterranean trade and had to call at several ports with merchandise and to take in goods for england on our return we left the island of corsica in company with several other vessels my ship however being a very fast sailor we were not long before we left them all behind the weather was fair and our voyage had been very successful so that i was in good spirits suddenly the sailor at the masthead saw a suspicious-looking craft in the distance i examined her attentively with the glass and at length became convinced that we were chased by pirates i felt at once that escape was impossible and resistance seemed almost hopeless as we numbered in all only seventeen hands and six passengers nevertheless i resolved to fight to the death rather than suffer myself and all on board to be earned away into slavery i hastily ordered the decks to be cleared and having armed all the crew and the passengers i had our six cannons loaded and waited with a beating heart for our deadly enemy to overtake us the pirates evidently did not expect any resistance on our part hoping no doubt that we should yield without striking a blow they made no preparations for action until they saw that we were prepared for an engagement we heard afterwards too that their vessel had received a good deal of damage in an action the day before with an english cruiser in which several of their crew had been killed indeed their vessel only escaped by her wonderfully fast sailing as soon as they got within range i fired one of the guns which created great confusion on board our enemy having as i afterwards learned killed their captain and two of the crew i kept up a brisk cannonade for some time to which they replied very feebly and without doing us any serious injury in a short time they ceased firing and i perceived that they were endeavouring to retreat but had much difficulty in doing so in consequence of the damage our firing had caused seeing this i crowded all sail in chase and we soon came up with them when they threw down their arms and suffered us to board them without any resistance we took about fifteen prisoners whom i landed at gibraltar and delivered over to the authorities there to take their trial for piracy as for the ship we found it needed but little repair to render it seaworthy though the mainmast was shot away and the rest of the rigging had suffered considerably so 
after doing what was absolutely necessary to keep her afloat i brought both ship and cargo with me to england in the hold we found several prisoners whom the pirates had taken and whose joy at their happy deliverance was unbounded among these to my great surprise and delight i recognized my old fellow-student the surgeon who i met at rotterdam and whose kindness to me in my distress had saved me from dying of starvation his astonishment and joy at such an unexpected meeting was as great as mine and was increased on finding so great a change for the better in my circumstances i told him my history since our last meeting and in return told me his which was almost as full of adventure as my own he had he said been wrecked on a desert island in his last voyage his ship and all his crew except himself and two sailors being lost having built themselves a hut they supported themselves for some months on some edible roots and berries which his knowledge of botany enabled him to discover on the island and their fare was occasionally improved by the addition of a bird or animal which they managed to shoot with roughly made bows and arrows during this time they were busily engaged in constructing a boat in which they hoped to be able to reach the mainland which was just visible in very clear weather after more than one failure they succeeded in making their boat water tight and set out with as large a store of provisions and water as their frail craft could carry with safety having chosen a calm day for their attempt and the wind being in their favor they reached the land without any accident but found themselves scarcely in a better position if so good as when they were on the island before they were wrecked the ship had been driven entirely out of her course by a terrific gale and they were now utterly ignorant as to their whereabouts they had not been many days on shore before a band of armed savages discovered them and as they were not in a position to offer any resistance they were taken prisoners and led away some distance inland here they suffered many hardships and were in constant fear of being put to death by their cruel captors several months passed away in this manner during which they were compelled to do the most laborious work and were very scantily fed and were often besides beaten and threatened with death until at length they effected their escape made their way to the sea shore and were fortunate enough to be rescued by a homeward-bound austrian merchantman which had stood in near the coast for the purpose of obtaining fresh water while on their voyage up the mediterranean the destination of the vessel being trieste they were captured by the pirate from whom i had so providently rescued them when we reached england my friends seemed so much to dread going to sea again that i easily persuaded him to accept from me a sum of money sufficient to enable him to return to his own country where i have since heard he set up as doctor in his native town and died a short time ago beloved and respected by all who knew him end of chapter nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c